Let's begin today's uh, Five at Five. Uh, my name is Andrew Thake from Minds and Money and welcome to, to the third of our Minds and Money Five at Five series for this week sponsored by Sprott. For those of you attending Five at Five for the first time, the aim of Five at Five is to maintain and get invest engagement between investors and miners through a lively interactive format during the current situation. A few admin announcements before we start. You can submit questions via the chat function. I've already posted a little message in the chat function at the bottom of the screen, and you can post your questions there. Uh, Richard and I will go and pick them up, and then we'll go and ask uh, the, uh, our uh, guest panelists, who Richard will introduce in a moment. Or even better, you can wave your hands via the invite participants function. I will unmute you, and you can ask your question live. We have a PAP program today, a star-studded lineup of guests. So to introduce them, I'd like to hand the floor over to Richard Morrow, Chairman of the Melbourne Mining Club. A warm welcome to Richard Morrow. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And thanks to Minds and Money for putting these uh, events on. They're certainly very popular. Uh, uh, it's uh, eight o'clock at night where I am in Melbourne. And uh, it, it's great that we can uh, join this forum from uh, all parts of the world. It's uh, it's a great experience. Um, now, as Andrew was just saying, five on five at five, uh, we try to be as interactive as possible. So uh, we had some great questions uh, from the audience in um, uh, our recent events. So uh, if you've got one, don't hesitate. I'll, uh, type it into the chat box and, uh, and away we'll go. We've got a great panel of miners and uh, managers of mining investment uh, with us today. Um, and uh, so the idea is what we'll, the way we'll work this out is we'll get a quick, quick summary from our presenting companies and then throw it open to our expert investors to ask the, uh, the pertinent question. And of course, don't forget, you know, type your question in the chat box there and we'll, uh, uh, we'll, come, uh, we'll come to you or I'll read it out. Um, so they're the rules. Uh, so let's get on to our, uh, our speakers today. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be able to uh, introduce uh, uh, this uh, this great lineup. First of all, we have Ian Barbara, uh, managing director of Saturn Metals, uh, one of the dynamic new breed of gold explorers coming out of Western Australia. WA keeps throwing up gold discoveries lately. I mean, just look at companies like De Grey and, and Musgrave. Uh, look, it's great to have you, here, Ian. Michael Hudson uh, is coming to us from uh, from my state, Victoria, uh, here today. He's chairman, chief executive officer of Mawson Resources, and he's recently joined uh, or rejoined uh, the uh, Victorian Gold Rush. We'll be asking Michael a little bit more about this later. We have Morgan Hart, the uh, Managing Director of Emerald Resources, Gold in Cambodia. We don't hear a lot about Cambodia these days, and uh, but Morgan's going to change all that for you today. Richard Hyde is the uh, Founder and Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of West African Resources, one of the newest of the new generation of West African gold producers. A great pleasure to have you on board, Richard. Uh, many of our audience today, myself included, have cheered you on at uh, Sembrado in Burkina Faso. And now for the money men. Uh, I've got uh, John Wong, Portfolio Manager at Ruffa, signing on from London, and Peter Groskopf, who's made a big effort to uh, get here uh, uh, all the way from Toronto, uh, Chief Executive Officer, of course, of Sprott. A tremendous panel. So first up, let's get right into it here, uh, Ian Bambra. Ian, Satin Metals is uh, a, a new Western Australian gold exploration company with the highly prospective Apollo Hill project. You've got a strong ground position with more than a 1,000 square kilometres uh, around the Leonora district. It's a great address. Ian, you're the Managing Director of Satin Metals. Uh, let's hand the floor over to you to tell us uh, a bit more about the company. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, yeah, I'll refer to a few slides in the, in the presentation, but keep it short and punchy for everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the introduction there on, on where we are, the little location map down the, the bottom there, uh, Australia, uh, the heart of West Australia in the, in the eastern gold fields, um, uh, and, and as Richard said, a, a great location. Uh, at the heart of that thousand square land package is, is our Apollo Hill uh, asset. And it's a big tonnage, low grade deposit. There's no getting away from it, but it, it works or it's starting to look like it's going to work for a number of, a number of reasons, which I'm going to kind of tick off here. 
Um, that diagram you're looking at there is a composite section through composite cross section through the deposit. And it's worth noting a couple of things about the geometry of it. First of all, the, the width of that gold system as we see it at the moment, and, and by no means, I, I don't think we've uh, touched the limits yet. It's about 600 meters wide. So that's, that's not a long section, that's a cross section. The little white lines you see are the, the resource cutoff depths as we've quoted at the moment for that 781. And at, at the bottom there, it kind of bottoms at only 180 meters depth. So our crops at surface, uh, virgin deposit, and, and starting to look like a, a very big <coughs> open pit opportunity. <coughs> Importantly there, particularly to the sort of right hand side of the diagram, uh, where our most recent exploration has been focused, uh, you see a much more sparse drill pattern and uh, some, some lovely mineralization starting to, start to happen. But I'll make the point that that system and the architecture within it is, is the same across that corridor. And what you're really looking at is a, a function of the, the drill density there. And, uh, we have a, a large sort of 50,000 metre programme planned to really pull that um, asset up to standard across that width. So I, I think that's, um, you know, at the end of that, down to 250 metres, there's the opportunity for a very large deposit. Um, as well as its geometry, the, the other thing that makes this uh, this deposit attractive, or at least from my perspective, is a, a very simple, elegant uh, metallurgy. The piece of core spinning around there, uh, you can see, or you can sometimes, it depends on the resolution on your screen, the little gold flecks in the middle of the white quartz veins. So coarse milling, free milling gravity gold, 60%. This was done on, on big uh, composites at 0.8 grams head grade. Um, at least up a quartile and arguably up a tenth percentile in the world. So cheap physical processing and even at the coarsest commercial grind size, we're still seeing excellent recoveries and, and you know, at 300 micron, 92% by 200 micron, we're in the 95, 96 and, and a very quick leach kinetics. So altogether that coarser grind also offers us the opportunity for, um, for some lower energy use. Um, that's another big lever for the deposit. And if, if I can ask for the next slide, um, I think the perhaps a, a point of differentiation for us from some of our other ASX listed peers is that the, the ounces at Apollo Hill are, are appearing in one big deposit. And you know, if you can imagine yourself on one of those little drill pads down there, there's a there's a scalability to this. <coughs> We've been drilling to the southeast on that lake, and I guess on the first slide, uh, that, that sort of eastern side of that deposit, that picture that's emerging as a result of that picture. So uh, we'll see 20,000 metres this quarter, resource upgrade plan for later this year. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the pressure on those drill rigs. And that's a very short, simple introduction to the company. Well, that's, uh, that sounds... Uh... Quite, uh, quite nice. Great address, uh, and uh, you know, there's uh, it's got a long history of mining in that uh, in that region. I'm going to throw over right away. Uh, let's not muck around to uh, John Wong, the portfolio manager at Ruffer in London. John, uh, you got a question here for Ian? Yeah, yeah. I, it looks like you are getting some good intersections actually towards a hanging wall, um, much better thicknesses and grey. Um, and you haven't had a resource update since last year. So I guess in your mind, given what you are doing right now, uh, what would you hope for in the next resource update? I and mean, what, would, what would it look like in terms of a success for you? Yeah, you put me on the spot there, John. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so but the, the best way to answer that, I think, is the, you know, with, with, with about 18 months of drilling, and, and 28,000 meters of drilling in, in just after listing, we delivered over a quarter of a million ounces uh, resource upgrade. We shifted 40% uh, of that resource into indicator category, so we're bringing the quality up as well. Uh, since that last resource upgrade, we've probably done about 24,000 meters. And we'll, you know, so if you, um, I'm not gonna give you a number here, but, that, that, that first upgrade was 28,000. I think yeah. 
uh, we, you know, we've done 24,000, we're still pushing on with an aggressive drug program for the next couple of months. And, and another way to answer that nicely, I guess, is for the company, uh, we, we published in our, after our general meetings, our performance incentives. And, you know, at the time we did it, uh, each November at annual general meeting, we look at performance incentives, not just for the directors, but for the almost staff, colleges, field assistants participate in this. Uh, by November 20, uh, a million ounce resource target, and by November 21, a million and a half ounce resource target. Now again, the targets, we're gonna go, you know, as, as hard as we can towards them. So hope, hopefully that gives you some feel of what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Can I just have a quick comeback? So on that, uh, at what point will you get to before you think, okay, I'm really happy with what we have and we can push on for a standalone mine slash development? Yeah, look, the, when, when, um, when we set those targets out, I, I think that they give you a feel for those kind of development stages. At the moment, the interesting thing is we're still pushing the boundaries uh, of the deposit. And the thing that's really going to make this work, I suppose, is the scalability of it, the opportunity to, to look at big selective mining units, push those um, unit mining costs down, and perhaps support a much bigger mill. So as, as far as I can keep expanding that operation and that opportunity, I'll keep drilling. I think along the way, there's the opportunity for us to, to you know, present uh, some snapshots of what the future mine might look at look like you know and perhaps my uh, geologically at least or size grade wise one of the best analogies is capricorn metals and, and when we kind of devised this 50,000 meter drill program earlier this year it, it was having a look at capricorn they'd they had a, a highly defendable million ounce in a pit and a million and a half global ounce resource and um, you know that that's a kind of nice starter position for us if uh, to, to try and achieve or, or match up to. Thank you. Uh, Peter Gloskov from um, uh, Sprott in Toronto. Uh, what would you like to, like to ask uh, Ian? Well, John's covered the uh, geological question, so I'll, I'll ask, I'll take a, a leap here and, and just ask Ian. You're trading fairly cheap on a per ounce basis based on uh, both your targets or even what you appear to have now. Uh, is your M&A phone starting to ring? Um, yeah. We... I realize you can't be too specific yeah. here. But... <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't. I mean, I don't have an M&A bonus is, is one way of answering it. And I, I think we, you know, from, from our perspective, we'd really like to see this thing through and, and from a personal perspective, you know, explore it, develop it, build it and, and get up and running. Um, but I think we, we have a strong and sticky shareholder base, but it would be, it would be very difficult for, for uh, someone to come along and sort of aggressively, if you want, I shouldn't, shouldn't put that out there. But th there's, a, there's a, an increasing interest in, in the deposit. It's, it's yeah, it's getting it's, getting to that commercial it's, size it's, now. Yeah, it is. And it's um, you know, and I, I guess you could say we're we're cheap, and I, I like that. That's what I've got to keep telling everybody. Um, but I, there's been a nice steady share price appreciate uh, appreciation yeah. over a couple of Absolutely. years, and that we intend to keep that trajectory going. Thank you. Oh, yeah, nice okay, to meet you. Thank, yeah, thank no, you very no, much. For that. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, for that, Ian, uh, I know uh, uh, my uh, my fund, the uh, Low Resources Trust, is a shareholder uh, of Saturn, and uh, we'll be following you all the way. So, uh, thank you very much for that today. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Michael Hudson, CEO of Mawson Gold, uh, Mawson Resources. Sorry, listed on the uh, TSX, but exploring on the international stage, including the uh, Great Victorian Gold Rush. Uh, Michael, tell us a bit about Mawson. Uh, thanks, Richard. You you weren't confused there. Uh, we were Mer Mawson Resources until relatively recently, and we changed our name. So uh, so you're doing okay. Um, we uh, 
we are a Toronto listed company, despite this accent and despite me sitting just down the road from you, I've had 20 years in the Canadian markets and, and uh, Mawson, Mawson has been focused in the Nordics primarily for most of that time with a few forays and, and uh, the most recent foray is, is back into the home state, which, which is uh, quite the, the pandemic uh, move. We did it beforehand, but uh, it's, it's certainly uh, worked out quite well for a number of reasons. One that, uh, one that we can actually continue to work these projects along with uh, our Finnish team that's been well-trained and versed for many years. So, so eight rigs uh, are going to be turning on four projects around the world uh, this year. Uh, this, is, this is the time to make discoveries. This is the time discovery is uh, rewarded for its opportunity rather than its result. And, uh, and as a consequence, you know, we've, we're funded and we've got the rigs turning in, in uh, four places. Uh, we've got a resource upgrade coming also for our finished project. So uh, the next slide, please, Elaine. Thank you. The, these are the four projects, uh, and uh, and this, the the strategy here is to focus most certainly on the first two, and and investors get a free ride in the second or the bottom two. So in, in Finland, where we've been for a number of years, we've made a, a discovery from first principles. There, uh, it was a little outcrop in the middle of a swamp, and we put something like fifty kilometres of drilling in that. Uh, it had a resource back 18 months ago when it only had 15 kilometres of drilling and around just north of 400,000 ounces. And, and uh, we're coming up for a resource upgrade with uh, triple the drill metres into it. Uh, drilled it down plunge. Um, so some of those drill intersections are a little deeper, but uh, you'll see a, a substantial increase uh, uh, based on, on the drill footprint that uh, people can go and see uh, on our presentation. On, on our website, mawsongold.com. 100% owned. Uh, we've only tested about 5% of the host horizon. It's a, it's a strata-bound <coughs> orogenic gold system, structurally controlled, but uh, still a lot of upside. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exploration project uh, morphed into a resource expansion project and, and many more ounces will come out of uh, this field. It's a, it's a 10 by 10 kilometer area and uh, and we've got three, three resource areas. A fourth is coming in this year, and we've got a number ready to, uh, to, to increase or, or bring to the resource uh, with continued drilling. So the resource upgrade's coming just shortly, but we'll have five rigs turning again when everything freezes up there in, in December. And, and, and a rig uh, starting in the next few weeks in areas we can access without frozen ground. So, so a project really on the move there. Uh, that's really seen as the solid base to the company. And what's really excited everybody is, is uh, uh, relatively surprising for me in many respects coming from Victoria. It's been a long time coming. Victoria hasn't seen this amount of enthusiasm or, or production since pre-World War I. And uh, Fosterville certainly put, put Victoria back on the map. And, and the opportunity here is to find not only another a Fosterville, uh, specific style that's been found within Fosterville, which is the Swan Zone, which is free, high grade, very high grade gold in, in, in quartz veins with, uh, with Asana Pirate and Stibnite. And that's very specific, but it's a, it's a very different style than, than's come from Victoria historically, where 80 million ounces have been mined. We've got uh, three projects, two joint ventures and one in our own right. Uh, Brownfields, areas that really haven't had a drill hole, literally under them ever. Um, and they were mined uh, you know, at uh, very high grades. And you know, one project's got 17 kilometers of combined strike of, of uh, veins that haven't uh, been tested below 50 meters where the old timer stopped at 50, 50 meters at the water table. So that's, uh, that's our focus. We're drilling in Victoria now. We've got uh, three geophysical teams. We'll increase the the number of drill rigs uh, as, as we go forward over the next month or so. So drill results will first come to the table in September and, and, and we're genuinely very excited about those projects. Then just very quickly, the last two projects there, uh, we've got uh, 60 kilometres of long strike from Cannington, which is one of the world's largest silver deposits. We've got the Queensland government fully funding a, a lottery ticket, a big deep hole on a gravity target along strike from Cannington. 
and we've got a partner drilling in our project uh, and that we've joint ventured out in in Oregon an epithermal field there so so two free kicks so I, I, I won't cover uh, the metrics I think I've gone a bit over time so um, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and leave it for questions uh, certainly uh, certainly thanks for that Michael uh, Peter uh, uh, what would you like to know from uh, Michael well, I was going to ask a different question, but I do sit on the board of Kirkland Lake Mines, so I, I uh, want to ask him, first of all, how far is your, your tenement in uh, Victoria from Fosterville itself? Uh, it's uh, 20 kilometres as the crow flies on, on uh, it's one of the adjacent fields. I can, I can brag a little bit. You shouldn't really brag against Kirkland, but uh, our, our project was mined 30 years earlier than Fosterville was because it was the higher grade project in the day. So, so I think, um, you know, it, it's just crazy that uh, something like that could be sitting there undrilled. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, moving over to uh, Finland then, um, what, what, I mean, you've had a lot of success with drilling there. And as you said, it's a, a massive land package. So any arm waving in terms of what your realistic targets are, what you'd be kind of comfortable with saying, uh, you know, ignoring the, the resource ounces for a second, what are you really looking for there? Or is it yet defined? Well, yeah, that's, uh, there was a, a the uh, forward-looking statement there that uh, that I didn't cover, but I'm a geologist, so I'm good at doing those kind of things. So, uh, making forward-looking statements, the it, it really we know a lot about a little part of this project. Uh, we found, you know, nine, well, 99% of the area is covered by glacial till. 99% of the area is therefore, you know, you can't walk across and find anything in outcrop. We found a few outcrops and drilled beneath them, and that's how we started finding. The, these bodies. We've extended them to depth, depth with an understanding of the geophysical relationships. Uh, and uh, like I said, we've only really explored 5% of that host horizon that snakes around the property. The analog here in Australia is the Tanami. And you could, uh, for those Australians, you can think of us as sort of the North Flinders was when that field was first opening up. And uh, the challenge is these things take a lot of drilling to, to build out. They're, they're high-grade shoots and the footprints are small, so they're, they're tough to find, and that's why their geophysics is very important. But we're, we're on a multi-million ounce field. I think any geologist who would look at the data can see that. And, um, and our, our game here is, or the, the challenge is to, to just define that, and, and, um, mm. and, and, and we're on the path. Okay, thank you. John, uh, uh, what would you like to know from uh, uh, from Michael here? Yeah, I think for me it's the uh, the Victorian one, which I'm probably less familiar with. Um, I, I remember you, you explained to me how you managed to get the project, but I guess looking at you know just in terms of drilling so far, what would you hope uh, to achieve? I guess from 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 your projects there. Uh, discovery <laughs> is the glib answer, um, and and uh, the the target is absolutely uh, one of these epizonal high grade systems. So so in Victoria, there's 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 two very different styles of mineralisation. Orogenic gold forms during orogenies, and there was two orogenies that produced the Bendigo or Ballarat style, and a different one that produced Fosterville or the epizonal style. And and nobody's really looked for the epizonal style. You know, Fosterville wasn't the greatest deposit until the Swan Zone was found. And, 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 and uh, it was the old timers who looked for these uber high grade systems that Swan is, and, and they do exist and they just need to be explored for. So, uh, you know, we, we hope to, be, to make one of these discoveries and, and drill it out, John, and, and create value uh, with the drill bit. That's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, the um, look, uh, thank you very much for that, Michael. I look forward to catching up with you in Melbourne when we get uh, let out of ha house arrest here. Um, and for our listeners there today uh, and our speakers, please uh, keep an eye on that chat uh, uh, group page. Um, if we don't get time to get to a question uh, from the audience, um, maybe uh, our speakers can. Uh, answer those privately because there's a couple of questions in there in that in that chat box that I think are really interesting but uh, time marches on and uh, and uh, I, I want to hear I want to change I want to go to something completely different now I want to go to Cambodia um, and I want to hear from Morgan Hart uh, here uh, thanks for joining the show today Morgan um, 
Emerald has recently generated substantial backing for the Ockbow Gold project. Can you uh, tell us a bit about this exciting development? Yeah, thanks, Richard, and thanks to uh, Minds of Money for the invitation to take part in this session. Uh, Emerald, uh, in a sort of snapshot, is an ASX listed gold mining company that's uh, currently developing a 100% owned uh, one million ounce Ockbow Gold project in the Kingdom of Cambodia. The project is a single pit, two gram, one million ounce um, open cut deposit. You have to basically go to a new jurisdiction like Cambodia, you get a two gram open cut like that anymore. Um, Emerald has uh, converted over 90% of the indicated resource at Ockbow to reserve. And I say that because it's significant. It just shows that how under drilled the project actually is. It's, uh, we've got to a point in our, in our development uh, uh, cycle where we decided that we could go and drill it out the depth and try and turn it into a two or three million ounce project which has potential for it, but would have changed the processing plant we're going to build, we decided it wouldn't. So we thought we'd build the processing plant and then get on with it and do that work out of cash flow later. Um, the, uh, um, the project obviously has strong potential for, up, for upside after we get into production next year. So the development of Ockbow is 100% funded. We did that uh, capital raising in the debt last year, so it very, helped, very um, uh, pleasingly helped us out in that sense in terms of the debt. Uh, we're about 50% through the construction at present, probably slightly less, uh, but we're about 50% of the committed spend on the project and we expect to bring the project $98 million uh, worth of development into uh, production the second quarter of 2021. Um, we'll be doing 110,000 ounces per annum through a 2 million uh, tonne per annum processing plant at an all-in sustaining cash cost of about $750 an ounce. It doesn't take an Einstein to work out that at $750 cash cost and near $2,000 gold price, the project's got very strong economics. Uh, we've got an MPV with a 5% uh, discount rate and a $1,700 gold price of 486 million and on the same metrics an IRR of 95%. Uh, the project's under drilled, as I said before, and obviously we'll be looking for, uh, for uh, significant upscale in the resource itself and the reserve at Ockbow, but also on the 1,400 square kilometres of tenure that we have around Ockbow with very similar geology, diorite intrusive winter into uh, into the country rock, the meta-sediment country rock. And just to give you an indication of that, uh, they're not on that sheet, but we've got intersections like uh, 15 metres at 11.9 grams, eight at 19 grams, 13 at seven grams, 10 at nine that sit outside the current reserve, and we'd expect to be part of the next expansion of the uh, our, uh, reserve and resource. In our, in our uh, surrounding tenure, we've got intersections like four at 10, four at 12, 16 at three, and nine at 6.6 .6 grams in, in historical drilling uh, within a sort of 25 and 50 K arc of the project area. We've got a great relationship with the Cambodian government, clearly with the first gold miner in Cambodia, first of significance, so significant size. Um, we've, um, we've developed a relationship with the government uh, by bringing first world principles in terms of environment and, uh, and operating safety. They're loving that. You know, we're interested in the first people to introduce a, um, uh, environmental bonding to Cambodia. They've never heard of that before and they're very thankful that we brought it to them. Uh, and what they allowed us with this relationship was to sign a uh, mineral investment agreement for the development of the project. And in that, we're basically de-risking the project because then it allows us a standstill, standstill on law provision. So uh, the laws can't be changed on us detrimentally as the project's developed. Uh, we've got offshore arbitration in case we do come into some kind of conflict with the government, that arbitration's in Singapore. We've got 100% ownership, which is really significant in the, in the Southeast Asia. A lot of projects have failed because there's, uh, many of the governments in Southeast Asia require you to either have a 50% local partner, or in fact, they take a big percentage of the government. <coughs> we don't have that in Cambodia. We've got freedom of banking US dollars, onshore and offshore. Um, and, the, and the agreement also gives us discount for in, income tax and withholding tax on dividends paid offshore. And also we get a full uh, import duty exemption for the first three years in the project. The board of directors done this before. We've come out a couple of machinations uh, in the past um, uh, past companies over the last 20 years. Uh, we've got an in-house development team. That development team's built four gold mines in the last uh, uh, 15 years, and in particular, and now obviously at, at uh, work at Ockbow in Cambodia. Um, the board's also aligned with shareholders, and we own 22% of, of a stake in the company, and uh, we bought that position. We haven't given ourselves that position for options. So in general, the company's aim is to obviously develop Ockbow uh, this year and next year, then expand on the reserves uh, at Ockbow itself with, with a significant upside, uh, explore the organic growth in Cambodia with this 1,400 square K tenure. And then we've been very um, uh, vocal in saying that we're looking for another asset. 
And uh, what we'd really like is an Australian asset to uh, complement the Cambodian asset. The reason for that is Cambodia generates a lot of cash flow, uh, a lot of profitability. Uh, but uh, and we've always been dividend paying uh, companies in our previous machinations of companies. Uh, when you own 22% of the company, the best way that you actually reward yourself is through a dividend and all other shareholders. The trouble in Australia, I'm sure it's the same everywhere else, is that uh, to have an effective tax dividends, you really need an Australian asset to have a tax base. So you get the franking credits when you're paying the shareholders their, uh, their dividends. So in a nutshell, that's that's Emerald. And the, the next slide up there obviously is showing you some, uh, some pictures of our development from about a month ago where uh, the progress we're actually at in, this, in the uh, development side of it. Well, Morgan, that's uh, great progress uh, made there um, on that one. Uh, yeah, just looking at your uh, uh, reserve or resource there and uh, and uh, your uh, production, uh, looks like if you have um, you bring any more gold inside uh, those uh, those numbers, uh, you know there must be, have you is there room in the design there for uh, scaling it up uh, and increasing production? There is, there is room, but to be honest, it's sort of organic in the in the uh, development of the project. It's, it really goes to a to an underground position beyond the first sort of one, one and a half million ounces. Uh, obviously, the first million ounces have got an open cut. There's probably another open cut uh, from there, which will come out about two grams. If we then shandy in some underground afterwards, the underground is looking like it's eight to 10 gram type material. It, you just get an, a, a positive uplift, obviously, by substituting two gram material with high grade underground material once that, that work's been done. Wow, that's uh, impressive. Uh, John Wong, a uh, uh, rougher in uh, London, uh, what uh, have you got in here? Yeah, I think, um, well, well done, by the way, in terms of your progress, I can see it on your timelines, you're, you're doing really well. I guess the question uh, as an investor is, um, what, what are the um, bottlenecks, I guess, um, from here till the end of the project? And what are the things that you feel are probably the biggest risk areas to getting it uh, completed and uh, you know operational on time. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, John. And, and obviously, coronavirus isn't making isn't making it easy for an Australian company to develop something offshore. You know, fortunately for us, Southeast Asia seems to have been uh, one of the uh, least affected areas for coronavirus itself. So actually, in country and in Thailand and Vietnam and China around it, there's a lot of capacity in to, in, in uh, fabrication, which is actually helping us out. So we've uh, we've uh, we're approached by a shop. A fabrication shop in Thailand uh, a month and a half ago telling us that they had no work in this particular shop. They've basically been completely engaged for the last uh, 10 years uh, doing fabrication for African projects. All of our all of our fabrications going through the one shop now, which wasn't our original intention, but we're getting great such great timelines out of that and, and pricing that it's hard to ignore that. The opposite side of that is that uh, we do have our shell, uh, our Udatec, um uh, process plant or process mill is being uh, partly built in Italy. Uh, Northern Italy was heavily affected, obviously, by coronavirus. The actual shell itself is on time-ish. We're probably looking at a couple of weeks overs on the on the shell itself. So it's a sort of a, you know it's, that's a concern to some extent, but but we've got well and that's well and truly in our timeline to bring the project into production by the second quarter next year. Our biggest issue is just moving people around. You know, um, when people go to Cambodia now, they're not going for two or three weeks or four weeks. They're going basically for two, three, four months. Because by the time you bring it back to Australia and they do two weeks in isolation, obviously it's very hard to move people around in that sense. Thank you. Uh, Peter, uh, can I throw to you for a question uh, here for Morgan? Sure, well, Morgan and I have uh, had extensive updates because we have a, a large position with, uh, with Emerald, but uh, I would ask Morgan about M&A, and uh, obviously, Morgan, you're, you and your team is, is a big reason why we, we bet on, on Emerald. Um, we think the, the project in Cambodia is well in hand. The question is, uh, given these uh, inflated now uh, prices, although uh, you know, justifiably inflated by the, the gold price, uh, how does your M&A pipeline look and what, what sorts of things do you uh, hope to uncover with your team in Australia? Yeah, thanks, Brad. It's a really good question. You know, the, I think we've, we've got an advantage in some respects. And, and to start with, things are overpriced now. You know, we, we're in the, we, every time we get into a bull cycle for gold, investors seem to forget about the difference between resources and reserves. And we start to pay, you know, valuations based on reserve, reserve type numbers for resources. So it does get much harder in that sense to uh, to try and tackle projects in outright cash purchases or in 
in takeovers, albeit if you've got a high um, an inflated uh, share price yourself, it's obviously a um, it's a relative matrix. What we what our advantage is is that because we do build our projects in house at the lower end of the capital scale, we can quite often offer a different alternative to a to a a mine that's never developed a project before by bringing in a capex spend at a at a significant discount to what a, to what an engineering group would do. So we did bid a company last year, which was in the public, that uh, had a total um, expenditure uh, requirement of about $150 million to build a project. When we looked at it, we thought we could do it for probably $90 million. And obviously we had a discussion on that basis. It wasn't successful, but that's the sort of things that we can still sort of move forward with. The, sit, the, the step back from that obviously is, is it becomes much more important to, uh, uh, to look for organic growth in Cambodia on this 1,400 square K of tenure, which was always part of the plan. But um, you know, we're hoping that uh, valuations, I suppose, come back to something a little bit more reason reasonable over the next uh, 12, 18 months when people work out the difference between uh, resources and reserves. So to be clear, in, in Cambodia, uh, that would be new pit, new pit potential or right, new, right. entirely new deposit potential? Yeah, correct. That's right. I mean, there's 1,400 square K of tenure there with, with mirror um, uh, geology to Lockbow itself. It's, it's, it's been underexplored. It's only really been a mining a code in Cambodia that's been workable for the last sort of 10 or 15 years. Uh, there's been some ups and downs, obviously, in that period of time, but uh, it's, it was basically underexplored Cambodia. And we fully expect that, uh, you know, with the stuff we've already seen, that we can potentially turn up other rock bows or, or certain um, satellite deposits to rock bow itself to add to it. Thanks, Warren. Thank you, Morgan. Um, and thank you for the questions there. And I'll tell you what, there's some great questions going up there in the group chat page. Uh, so if I could ask our speakers all to ha have a look at that, and because uh, uh, there's some pretty good conversations developing there off, off screen. Uh, and likewise, in the audience uh, there, if you'd like to put up a question, please do. Our speakers would be more than happy to answer it. Uh, thank you very much. And now, our final mining update of the show is from Richard Hyde, founder, chief executive officer and chairman of West African Resources. Richard, what a great job you've done bringing this high-grade mining operation into being, you know, pouring gold, delivering shareholders a substantial reward for their patience and your persistence. Can you bring us up to date with on the company and, uh, and your brand new mine in Burkina Faso? Thanks very much, Richard. Look, um uh, thanks to, to Mines of Money and Sprite for, for hosting this event. It's um, uh, great to be here. Can we just go back a slide? I just want to show you a picture of what the, uh, the new project looks like. This is newly minted, uh, 10 years worth of hard work uh, right here. So West Africans, a, a, a company I started in the late 2000s after working uh, in Africa for uh, you know, five or six years. I was based, um, based over there for quite a while. And, I even did some work for Morgan back in his um, previous uh, job when he was working for Recreate Gold. Um, you know, we listed in 2010 and we, we worked pretty hard doing small raisings through the early two, uh, 2010 onwards. Um, you know, so even though we, we're seeing some really good success now, uh, it's taken a, a fair while to get there. So we're not, we're not taking things for granted. So I think that's one thing out of this current market is just to stay humble and work hard still. Um, so yeah, I think the key takeaway from our presentation is we're unhedged. So we are uh, the ASX's um, most recent or newest uh, unhedged gold producer. So the deal that we did in our in our debt financing in, in 2018 meant we could um, we could borrow our money without um, a large hedge, which obviously takes away the upside to investors. Um, we we obviously made a discovery in 2016 it was at M1 South, which is a high grade, the high grade zone. Um, we drilled it for two or three years. We raised money along the way. Uh, we raised all our equity and debt in 2018 and we got stuck into the build in 2019. Um, and that resulted, if you skip on the next slide now, uh, that resulted in us uh, bringing the project in about three months ahead of schedule. Uh, we were 20 million US under budget. And uh, I think, um, it was a credit to our team and it's unusual for a junior making that transition from explorer to, to producer uh, that, that we managed to do that. Uh, so look, we, we've had a pretty good ramp up so far. We've been processing open pit oxide material from mostly from the M5 deposit uh, and we've been processing underground development ore from M1 South um, over the last couple of months. 
Uh, like Morgan alluded to, it's been very tough getting people in and out of country. So we lost a bit of schedule with the underground in Q2. Um, and we, we're back on sort of track now. So we've, we're just firing the first shots into the, uh, the first underground stoke. Um, we produced uh, about 30,000 ounces in our first quarter of production. Uh, we're on, on track to uh, beat that by about 50% in our second quarter of production. And I think Q4 this year is when we really start um, hitting our stride. And, and, you know, from Q4 this year, we're on track to produce uh, over 300,000 ounces of, of gold unhedged. Uh, so, you know, at, at cost of around about 500 US. So, you know, I'm no mathematician, I'm just an exploration geologist, but that will tell you that we're going to do something like, you know, over 400 million US of free cash flow in calendar 2021. So, making some serious money, obviously we uh, will be focusing on paying down our debt and, um, and building some cash uh, and, and perhaps looking to pay some of that cash back to shareholders, some of our long, long serving shareholders. Um, and uh, I'm one of those as well. So that's what I'll be looking forward to. Um, the project's going to do about 200, 220,000 ounces over the first five years. And, and from the study in 2018, um, we were going to average about 150,000 ounces over, over 10 years. We're currently working on improving that. So we've got the drill bit turning again. We're drilling at M1 South at depth. Uh, we'll have some nice results out on uh, M1 South later this month. And then in Q4 this year, we'll be um, uh, doing a full resource reserve update. So currently we've got a resource, a drill resource of about 3.1 million ounces. Uh, we are in the pro process of upgrading the Tuiga deposit, which is a new acquisition. So we've got over 4 million ounces of, of gold in the company uh, and just under 2 million ounces of gold in resources. So uh, about 700,000 ounces at 10 grams in the, in the underground reserve. And we've got um, about a million ounces in open pits at 1.6 grams. All the mineralization on our project is free milling. So it's, we've got a nice, simple plant. Uh, we're getting very high gravity recoveries. Um, and we'll have a big update later on this year. So just sliding on to our, our next slide. Uh, so the near-term catalysts, uh, this is what you know, investors should be looking for from West African over the coming months. Um, we completed our building commissioning ahead of schedule. So we've, we've ticked a lot of boxes already. Uh, the underground, uh, we've already been producing development ore. Uh, we, we poured our first guide and we're ramping up nice and smoothly. Uh, we've started doing the deep drilling at M1 South and that's something we haven't done since 2018. Uh, it's very important that investors understand that when we, uh, when we started building the project, we'd only drilled about six years worth of underground. Um, our deepest hole at depth uh, hit 15 metres at 25 grams. And we are now drilling around that at depth as well. So the plan here is to drill out um, you know, 10 years worth of underground uh, reserve and also to match up with our 10 years plus 10 years of open pits. Um, so investors can... Uh, expect to see some results towards the end of this quarter, sorry, <laughs> towards the end of this month, only a few weeks away. Uh, like I said, we've just fired our first shots into the <coughs> underground. So I'd expect that um, we'll hit our full run rate for production in Q4 this year. So um, from the end of this month, early next month. Um, we'll also have some updates on exploration. So something we haven't talked about for a while because we've been so focused on building the project. Uh, and then we'll be tucking to Eager in as well, which is um, just 15 kilometres down the road and it's going to generate a lot of free cash flow for the company. It was a really good deal for, for West Africa that we managed to, to do with B2. Um, and finally, for this year, will be the resource reserve and production guidance. So, so currently, we're still operating off our guidance from the feasibility study. Uh, but, um, you know, with all of the, the work that we've done this year and uh, what we're experiencing with um, production at the moment, we're actually seeing, you know, a higher nameplate throughput with um, uh, the, the process plant and we'll, we'll wrap that up into production guidance for, for 21 and uh, a new life and mine plan as well. So that's a quick update on West African, uh, the ASX's newest unhedged gold producer. Um, happy to turn it over for some questions. Well, Richard, that's, uh, that's fantastic uh, there. Um the combination of high grade uh, gold and uh, an un unhedged book is uh, is uh, very very attractive uh, look i'm going to ask the nasty question though i'll put my investor hat on and uh, you know when we heard that uh, coup in mali uh, you know 
all our hearts were in our mouths about what would happen. But the, the market didn't seem to take much um, or pay much attention to that. To uh, you know, some great companies now are listed in that West African, many countries there, and uh, uh, and uh, it, it, the attitude seems to have changed a fair bit. Can I get your comment on that? Oh, look, I think uh, investors have had a lot of experience, and look, companies operating there. Have- it goes back to the early 2000s with my experience there working with, with Morgan back um, nearly 20 years ago. Um, and look, we had the same experience in Burkina in 2014 with um, a popular uprising and, and then uh, an interim government and, and elections in, in late 2015. So, um, look, I obviously, uh, look, I, th- I think um, people are quite experienced with it. And, and throughout all of the, the disruptions that we've seen in West Africa over the last four or five years, or even going back longer, um, generally mining has been uninterrupted. So even in Burkina in 2014-15, you've seen all the mines that were in production con- continue to pr- uh, produce gold and pay taxes and royalties to the government. So uh, look, I think it's, a, it's something we've seen before. And it, while, while it's, uh, it's not ideal, um, I, look, I think uh, we've got experience in dealing with it. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Peter Groskopf in uh, Toronto, can I uh, throw to you for a question there and maybe ask beforehand, uh, how are North American investors um, uh, feeling about uh, West Africa these days before before you ask your question? Well, um, I, as, as Richard said, I think people are, are a bit more experienced these days. Um, where there's risk uh, and there is some risk in West Africa, but uh, there's also a great opportunity. So for instance, my next door neighbor is the guy who runs for cola for B2. And uh, I mean, talk about cash flow. It's just unbelievable um, how much a, a rich mine like that can produce. And as Richard said, I think the, the government needs the revenue. So, uh, you know, lots of change can happen and still support the, the mining industry. Uh, Richard, I guess first thing um, I would like to ask or, or, or mention is you don't look that much older. I think considering you've been through it now, uh, mm-hmm. I think you, you should take a, a properly deserved victory lap. And um, I would ask you, um, look, the, the one thing that has happened is there's been a, a, a little increase in mil- militarism in the country and, and some terrorist acts. Uh, you're not in that area, but... Now that you've got a really substantial financial company, the question is, what do you do next? Are you going to concentrate in country where you can undoubtedly make lots more cash flow? Or do you look elsewhere um, with, with, uh, with that, all that financial might that you're going you're gonna to create? Yeah, well, I think, um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. Look, I think firstly, We've got to bed down what we've got. So, you know, we did a great deal with uh, with B2 just down the road with mm-hmm. Coaga. Uh, we see significant value in that. Um, I was talking about our work programs going on this year. We're drilling at the moment and we'll be recutting our life of mine plan. Uh, we hope to roll Coaga into that as well and, and really build out a, you know, plus 10 year uh, mine plan at, um, you know, more than 200,000 ounces of production per annum. Uh, and have that robust at, you know, 1,200, 1,300 gold. So, you know, one thing we're not going to do is we're not going to chase the gold price up with our reserves. Um, I, I think then you're, you're only adding marginal ounces anyway. So that's our first goal is to really uh, get the maximum value out of what we've already got. Uh, and then secondly, we'll also, we're locking down our, our kind of exec team and our build team for the next three years. So it's something that I'm mindful of. And one of the companies I admire, which is obviously from Canada, is B2 Gold. Um, they've managed to to build a phenomenal company over the last decade, and they're producing a million ounces a year now with um, with Ficola making, uh, I guess, a lion's share of that production. But what they've done really well is they've kept their build team together, and they've managed to find good assets to develop, and, and that's something that we're focusing on. Uh, we, we're quite comfortable in West Africa, so I, I think we'll stay in the region. Um, look, it's I, I think the Australian market is uh, probably like the Canadian market. It's uh, it's pretty heavy, heavily populated with um, with companies and producers. Uh, and I think we've got a real edge in West Africa. We've got a lot of experience and we've just been through the full process with um, with San Brado. So, look, I, th- I think that's that's where we'll focus. And, and if you look at the countries like um, 
you know, Burkina, Mali, Senegal and Ivory Coast, they've all got very similar mining codes. Uh, so, you know, a transition into one of those countries would be pretty seamless for us as well. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hey, Great, an Great answers there. Uh, John uh, uh, Wong uh, in London, uh, have you got a question there at all? Yeah, sure. Uh, Richard, first thing first, congratulations. I think it's been a great, great result. Um, I think the question that I have just relates to uh, the commissioning process. So I've seen that you know, you've know had commercial production and the ramp up is carrying on ahead. I just want to find out, I guess, are there any, any potential risks out there in terms of the uh, ramp up, you know, whether it's, you know, are you reconciling grades, tons, that kind of stuff? Uh, look, I think we threw that now, John. Uh, we, yeah. we obviously the plant came in early, so we were about three months ahead of schedule, and you know we've been sort of marketing the fact that we were going to do three hundred thousand ounces from the start of production. But you know the difference between a feasibility study and, and re reality is that the plant was early. Um, the the mining contract, the open pit mining contractor, uh, really didn't mobilise until uh, December nineteen, early. 2020. So uh, we ended up running the first sort of six or eight weeks uh, on really low grade open pit material. Uh, we, um, we, we've batch treated some of the high grade material from the underground as well. So we know that all the circuits are working. So the gravity circuits working beautifully. Um, and then what we've seen in the last sort of uh, two or three months is the open pit mine grade starting to improve. So we, we uh, We've worked our way down through some of the historic artisanal um, areas where it's been mined historically by local miners. Uh, so we've seen the grade improving. Uh, when we batch treated the hard material from the underground, it's gone through without any problems. Uh, the gravity circuit sees these massive spikes in, in gravity recovery, um, which is really good. And you know what we're expecting is from you know probably mid this month or late this month we'll start to see. You know, like a thousand tons a day, roughly, of underground material coming into the um, into the feed into the plant, uh, and we'll we'll blend that through and manage the obviously the the high grade nature of the mineralisation. Um, our tails grade has been very low, so we we're sort of sitting around that 0.1 of a gram tails grade, which is really important. Uh, overall recoveries are kind of increasing as well. So when we started off, uh, we were around about 91 percent. Now we're kind of seeing pretty consistent sort of 93, 94% recovery. So uh, I'm pretty comfortable with, um, with the ramp up and uh, we're really just waiting to see how, how we go with um, an increase in the underground feed. You know, we've got a, a reserve grade of 10 grams per tonne. So once we start feeding that in on a regular basis uh, and blending that through with our open pit feed, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see the production profile really spike up. And, you know, we've got the next 12 to 18 months of, uh, you know, we'll be averaging about uh, 70 or 80,000 ounces a quarter. So it's significant production mm -hmm. and completely unhedged. So, um, you know, we, we're really looking forward to making some significant cash flow. Great, that's, thank you. That's great. Great question uh, there. And uh, I, I love the way we focus on that cash flow, which is which is fantastic. I mean, else yeah. might do it. Can I, oh, I've got you there, John. With a little chatter uh, here about M&A, uh, how do you feel? Is, it, is that becoming a significant uh, force or feature of the uh, global gold market at the moment from where you sit? Yeah, I, it's interesting on the m and I haven't seen as many as I thought I would, actually. Um, I thought there'll be more m and uh, but I haven't seen that many uh, uh, companies coming together. There's some small deals, but nothing big. Um, in my mind, this is inevitable. It will happen. Um, and I think the real story, and this is something I've been, you know, kind of thinking for years now, is that in the fullness of time, a lot of companies are not replacing reserves and definitely not the same quality reserves. Okay, that's definite. And exploration has been basically uninvested or haven't been invested in for years until the recent months. So I do expect a lot more M&A in the future. I just haven't seen it yet. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Peter, can I throw to you on that? Um, what, what sort of things do you think will, uh, are the driving forces of M&A uh, or maybe the M&A to come in the, uh, in the gold sector? 
Well, uh, I feel pretty strongly about this. Um, the shortage in the industry is actually the build development teams, like some of them we've seen today. That it, There's no shortage of capital and um, there's no shortage of projects. There's a shortage of projects that can be built. And as John said, uh, it is now cheaper for bigger companies to buy these projects um, than to develop them themselves, especially given the timelines, especially given the shortage of build teams. So I feel very strongly that although it's been a COVID year where it's been very difficult for companies to execute on m and I mean, let's face it, most mining companies in the world spent six months just figuring out how to make their own operations safe. There was no capability for a board of directors to approve an external deal. 2021 will be a very different story. I think it is gonna be a record year for m and I, I think this mm -hmm. sector is going to light up because the big companies trade at significantly different multiples than the smaller companies. And you just can't ignore that math. That math differential is huge. So it's going to be, it's going to be, the, the game will be on next year. And uh, the, the, you can see the cash flow, especially we're talking a lot about free cash flow uh, here today. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, presenting itself and maybe the biggest driver, do you think? Do um, you think there'll be a uh, are funders, uh, are banks, uh, financiers happy to to push uh, M and A ideas uh, out to their um, out to the bigger companies at the moment? Do you think? Yeah, the ideas are certainly circling and uh, circulating, and um, the banks are lending, um, w which has kind of been a slow improvement over the last few years. And there's uh, lots of specialty lenders uh, such as ourselves that are eager to get money deployed. Again, there's no shortage of capital and uh, the bigger companies all have uh, substantial unused debt capacity at very low rates now. So, you know, the, the, all of the kindlings ready for the fire, as John said, a little bit surprised it hasn't started already, but it's, it's that kind of year where things are, are just slow. So I think it's going to, going to start up very soon. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Uh, thank you for that insight there. Well, look, uh, we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour and uh, time for me to, to thank all our speakers uh, here today. Um, so one more time, if you could keep your eye on those uh, that chat uh, page uh, on your screen there. There's a few good questions there that still uh, would, I think people would love to have an answer. So uh, please have a look at that. And likewise, if you've got one last question in the audience there, pop it up on the chat page and maybe we can put people together to, uh, to get answers for you uh, uh, after the event is closed. Um, but uh, really, uh, in, in, if we're here personally, I'll be asking people to put their hands together, but we could probably uh, uh, virtually uh, do that to thank our, our, our company speakers here today, Ian Bambra uh, from Satin Mineral, uh, Metals over there in uh, WA, uh, Michael Hudson here in the great state of Victoria in Australia with Mawson Gold, uh, Morgan Hart, great presentation. Uh, uh, from Emerald there, mates, on, um, uh, uh, you know, that was uh, a very interesting insight into what's going on in Cambodia at the moment. And, of course, Richard Hyde, uh, mate, it was, a, it was a marathon and you got there, mate. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for, uh, for giving us all hope uh, of the uh, to come. Uh, uh, I'd like to hand back now to, uh, to Andrew Thake from Minds and Money uh, to, uh, to wind it up. Many, many thanks for being a great MC, Richard. Many thanks to our guests. Many thanks to our sponsors, uh, Sprott. And also many thanks to the audience. Our final uh, Sprott 5 at 5 of this week's Minds and Money Online Global will take place in three hours' time. Look forward to meeting you all then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. thanks very much. Thank you.